And today, in our final installment of Dino or No, we will be talking about this. A little dusty. This is a chicken. But is it a dinosaur? So today we're going to talk about whether or not a chicken, or any bird for that matter, is actually a dinosaur. For a lot of us, a chicken looks nothing like a dinosaur. Who are you fooling? But let's just explore this a bit. Here's Penny's awesome whiteboard again. And let's talk about some of the things we talked about over the last two episodes. We talked about how if we look at the skull from the side. Okay, I'm going to put teeth in here. Then we have the eye. Fancy called the orbit. And then we have this opening here, which is the nares. which is your nose hole, because you have to get air in and out. And then I'll add this in underneath here. Hidden underneath here is the brain, brain case, which is a separate thing. But then we have, in some animals, two extra openings in the side. When there's two openings, then this animal is a diapsid. Okay. And we can visualize this looking at the skull from behind. If we were to look at it from behind, here's our brain case. And then... Here is this sort of external armor, and we'd have misplaced our other pen. It was under the chicken. We have an opening here and an opening here, two on each side. These are the same openings. One, two, one, two, one, two. That's the diapsid condition. And what we've learned is that this condition is, the diapsid condition is true for um, is true for all reptiles. It's true for pterosaurs. And it's true for dinosaurs. And it also happens to be true for birds. This is not the case for fossil organisms like Dimetrodon. This guy. These only had one opening in the side here, the lower one. And those are us. So this raccoon skull is has a single temporal or a yeah, single temporal opening. Not a dinosaur, not a diapsid. We are synapsids. Dimetrodon is a synapsid. This is a synapsid. So, yes, this is a synapsid, not diapsids. All right. But dinosaurs are diapsids. Lizards, like the Sphenodon, are diapsids. This pterosaur is a diapsid. 
And as I mentioned, now I've got this is this is plastic, just so you know. This is a chicken skeleton. It's also a diapsid. Okay, well you're looking at this going, yeah, but where are those openings? Well, if you're a bird, you're you're so heavily modified, it's it's a little crazy, but a chicken skull looking for I'm looking for this. If we're looking at birds. something highly modified this chicken skull or actually I don't know what it is I'm drawing here but if you've ever seen a chicken skull or any kind of bird skull they're pretty wild looking big orbit and they have Big opening here. Probably another one down here. We're gonna go with that. This is the this big one is the orbit. Here's an Aries. And birds, just like mammals, the openings have become so heavily modified that they've all but disappeared, but they're still there. We're gonna, I'm making stuff up, but there's some openings down there. All right, so they're still diapsids, all right? So this is a bird. Still is a diapsid. But also, as we learned, just because you're a diapsid does not automatically make you a dinosaur. So, for example, we learned that even though pterosaurs are diapsids, they're not dinosaurs because they lack a couple of very important openings. There's an opening here and an opening here. This one is the ant orbital fenestra. And this one is the mandibular fenestra. Ant orbital just means in front of the eye, and you see it is in fact in front of the eye. Mandibular fenestra or mandibular means it's in the lower jaw. The word fenestra just means a window. So these fenestra, fenestrae. I don't know how you'd pluralize that. They in dinosaurs, there is the antorbital fenestra, which we don't have because we're not even diapsids. And some diapsids have the antorbital fenestra, which we don't have because we're synapsids, so it doesn't even apply. But the antorbital fenestra is in front of the eye and behind the nose. Just like shown here. And then there's a, another opening in the lower jaw, the mandibular fenestra. So, in birds, as it happens, they do have a very, very small opening right here. Because they're so heavily modified, it isn't really obvious, and some, some of them is missing, but they do have the ant orbital fenestra. So by having the ant orbital fenestra, it combines them in with the groups that are considered dinosaurs. So, birds are dinosaurs. This chicken is a dinosaur. Now I'm going to take this one step further and we're going to talk about how paleontologists, how scientists, how people like me actually classify animals. Because we're used to thinking about birds 
being distinct from fish, from being distinct from reptiles, and so on. And some of it is a semantic argument. So I'm going to explain this in just a moment. Let's talk about how we classify organisms. And we've been used to, in our, in our lives, used to classifying things such as, hi Mia, you can help, fish, reptiles, birds, mammals, and I've left out amphibians. But in our e existence, in the way we understand the world right now, we are able to pretty much just break these out into groups that don't overlap. And that's really convenient. And so when we come up with our classifications, we've had... Um, we can call this the class Reptilia, class Aves, and the class Mammalia. All right. So this is how we've thought about things in our in our existence you know as we've we are it is in our in our nature as humans to classify things so we conveniently group things and in our experience these things do come out quite nicely and then we add things like the dinosaurs so we have the dinosaurs well, there's no living dinosaurs that, at least things that when we were coming up with classification scheme that made sense. So we just called this a class dinosauria. N-O-A-U-R-I-A. -A. And there we are. Well, this is great and convenient, but when we look at the fossil record, this isn't at all how it works. There are in-betweens. There is a cat rubbing on the microphone. I'm going to move the cat. There are forms that don't really fit well in either category, like, for example, Dimetrodon. I mean, if you look at Dimetrodon, saw this thing. It looks like a reptile, but really it's more closely related to mammals. And, but really it's not either, depending on how you define your terms. So, so let's talk about coming back to our chicken. Where do chickens fit into this grand scheme of things? How does this work? So, diapsids include reptiles, birds, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. We know this. Diapsids include reptiles, birds, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. We know this to be the case. These are all diapsids. also includes crocs. Okay, now some of these diapsids include the ant orbital fenestra. Which we were just talking about. It excludes so what we consider reptiles traditionally are excluded from this. Now we throw in some extra characteristics, 
which are important. It has an antorbital fenestra. And also is an obligate biped and has what we call a parasagittal stance. Of all of these organisms, only dinosaurs and birds share these characteristics. And this group that we're talking about is named the Dinosauria. Now, what is an obligate biped? Well, if you've looked at a chicken, it's, oh no, you've looked at a chicken, they walk on two legs. Dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus, walk on two legs. Now, there are some dinosaurs that walk on four legs, but the first dinosaurs, the earliest dinosaurs, the, the first dinosaurs that were actually dinosaurs that are members of the Dinosauria, only walked on two legs. And more importantly than that is this parasagittal stance. And we can see this in this little model of the chicken. And what it is, <clears throat> if we look at it, okay, there, chicken. There's your chicken. Notice how the legs are aimed straight down. This is important. Just like in us, or in a horse, or a cat, or any other animal, the legs are directly underneath the bird, ouch, or the dinosaur, hello Mia. Um, and this is called the parasagittal stance. This is in opposition to the sprawling stance, like we, we, we associate with lizards and, and crocodiles, where their arms are splayed out. Now, you've seen reconstructions of dinosaurs with their legs splayed out, but that's not correct. We, we know that dinosaurs had their limbs tucked underneath them. What this does is it allows you to move faster and more efficiently. This is why Tyrannosaurus is so fast. Um, and birds and dinosaurs possess this parasagittal stance or having the feet underneath them. And... That's what unites birds with the dinosaurs. Now, going back to what we had said before, when we think about dinosaurs, dinosaurs and birds as separate groups. But really, what we recognize today as birds, the modern birds, let me put this here. Modern birds are a subgroup within the dinosaurs. So even though we talk about the class Dinosauria and the class Aves, really the Dinosauria is a much larger group that includes within it the Aves, the birds, which means that in fact birds are dinosaurs.